Hello, welcome to Exposures to Raw Nanomaterials. My name is Pete Rayner. I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. The objectives for this module are that, by the end, learners should be able to list types of workplaces where exposures to raw nanomaterials can occur, identify potential exposure routes and risks related to each type of workplace, describe tasks and processes that lead to exposure risks across workplaces, and relate exposure potential to production processes. There is an interesting analogy to our concern about worker exposures in the emerging nanotechnology industry in the discovery and early use of X-ray technology. X-rays were first discovered by Wilhelm Rankin, shown in the photo, in 1895. As he investigated the paths of electrical rays called cathode rays under a partial vacuum from an induction coil through a glass tube covered in black paper in a completely dark room, Rankin observed that a plate some distance away coated with a fluorescent compound was illuminated. Additional experiments showed that these X-rays, which he named because of their unknown properties, penetrated different objects to varying degrees and that they penetrated more poorly through thicker objects than through thinner ones. When he placed his wife's hand in the path of the rays in front of a photographic plate, Rankin produced the first X-ray image, showing the bones in her hand and the wedding ring on her finger. He reported his discovery in the paper on a new kind of rays to the Institute of Physics and Medicine of Würzburg. For his discovery, Rankin won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901. Rankin's discovery created a sensation. Within months, other researchers had produced and were showing images, including cranial x-ray images like this one, which can be considered among the first dental x-ray images. The application of x-rays in dentistry was almost immediately acknowledged. The public was intrigued. Enterprising photographers established studios for bone portraits where customers could have x-ray images taken as a novelty. In addition to dentistry, the application of x-rays to medical diagnostics was quickly recognized as well. On February 3, 1896, a New Hampshire physician named Gilman Frost and his physics professor brother, Edwin Frost, took an x-ray of the broken wrist of a boy named Eddie McCarthy. This is considered the first American medical x-ray. X-ray laboratories were set up in hospitals, like this one in a Philadelphia hospital, to perform real-time diagnoses of a variety of conditions. The image shows Dr. Miron Kasabian at work. The device he is using is a primitive fluoroscope that required manual examinations through the patient's body. Thus, the diagnostician, like the patient, was exposed to x-rays. We now know that x-rays are electromagnetic radiation with much larger frequencies and much smaller wavelengths than visible light. Because the energy of electromagnetic radiation is proportional to frequency, x-rays have very high energy. X-rays are a form of ionizing radiation, meaning that they can remove tightly bound electrons from the orbit of an atom, causing the atom to become charged or ionized. Acute exposures to ionizing radiation can cause radiation sickness that leads to gastrointestinal disorders, bacterial infections, hemorrhaging, anemia, loss of body fluids, electrolyte imbalance, and even death. Chronic exposures to ionizing radiation, including x-rays, can damage human DNA, potentially leading to development of cancer. At the end of the 19th century, however, no one anticipated that exposures to x-rays might be harmful. After a few years, some of those who worked with x-rays suffered skin cancers on their hands. Some had operations to amputate fingers, hands, and even arms. The recognition that x-ray exposures were dangerous grew as these cases were reported. Dr. Miran Kasabian, who was shown in his laboratory on the previous slide, died in 1910 of cancer at the age of 40. These were his hands after amputation of some of his fingers as his condition progressed. He recorded that between 1898 and 1900, he performed fluoroscopy on more than 3,000 medical and surgical patients and made more than 800 radiographs. Dr. Kasabian carefully documented his illness 
tying his case to x-ray exposures, in part because his left hand, which was more exposed to x-rays, developed skin abnormalities earlier and to a greater extent than his right hand. The inability to anticipate and recognize the potential health effects of the emerging x-ray technology led to disease and death in many technicians and clinicians who worked with x-rays. What does this historical analogy tell us about the potential risks of exposures to nanomaterials? Like nanotechnology today, x-rays at the end of the 1800s were an emerging technology with many potential applications. X-ray exposures presented and still present unique health concerns. There were no regulatory occupational exposure limits or standardized measurement methods to assess exposures to x-rays when the technology was introduced. Once the health risks were recognized, experience and empirical evidence provided early guidance for reducing worker exposures to x-rays. Over time, the technology developed in ways that have minimized health impacts among both workers and consumers while still allowing the benefits of the technology to be implemented. The emergence of nanotechnology has a number of parallels to the emergence of x-ray technology. Like x-rays, nanomaterials are a new capability with many potential applications. Like x-rays, exposures to nanomaterials present health concerns. Fortunately, the occupational hygiene profession has anticipated and recognized these concerns before anyone has become sick to the best of our knowledge. There are a few non-regulatory occupational exposure limits specifically for nanomaterials, but most nanomaterials have no relevant limits at this time. More importantly, we have yet to develop methods to measure exposure specifically to engineered nanomaterials. In this respect, we have difficulties assessing exposures that are similar to those experienced when x-rays were newly discovered. As happened with x-rays, we are using experience and empirical evidence to develop ways to manage exposure risks in nanotechnology workplaces. In the end, we hope and expect that nanotechnology industries will develop in ways that minimize detrimental effects on workers and the public, while still allowing applications of nanotechnology with broad benefits to society. This drawing from Sutton co-authors shows some of the steps in the life cycle of engineered nanomaterials. The first step is production of raw engineered nanomaterials. At this point in the life cycle, there is potential for worker exposures to hazards as the workers handle precursors or the nanomaterial product. Manufacturers then fabricate nanomaterial enabled products that contain engineered nanomaterials. Here too, workers face potential exposures to engineered nanomaterials as they handle incoming nanomaterials during the production processes and during maintenance and cleanup. These will be the two focus areas of this module. Exposures from those working with nanomaterial-enabled products and from those who may be exposed to engineered nanomaterials in waste streams or the ambient environment will be covered in later modules. One workplace setting that is not covered specifically in this diagram is laboratories. Many, many researchers study nanomaterials in laboratories. Some specialty nanomaterial products are made in relatively small batches in a laboratory environment. In addition, laboratory technicians working in larger scale production and fabrication facilities perform analyses on engineered nanomaterials and ENM enabled products to ensure uniformity. The laboratory workplace can certainly not be neglected. We will focus on several different processes that have the potential to create exposures to raw engineered nanomaterials among workers. We will focus first on exposures during the synthesis of nanomaterials. Next, we will look at exposures that are possible during the cleaning and maintenance of reactors after synthesis. We will then move on to the handling and packaging of engineered nanomaterials. We'll look at the possibility of exposure during the characterization of engineered nanomaterials in laboratory settings. Finally, we'll discuss the possibility for exposures as engineered nanomaterials are incorporated into products. Several factors are particularly important when considering the potential for exposure to raw nanomaterials. First is the material dusting. If it has the propensity to generate airborne particles, exposures are likely. Nanomaterials are commonly produced as either a dry powder or in a liquid suspension. In most cases, dry powders are much more likely to generate airborne particles than liquid suspensions. In addition, the physical properties of the material, especially particle size, shape, and density, can strongly influence the dustiness of a nanopowder. Secondly, 
The type of process can strongly influence the potential for unwanted exposures. Tasks that involve manual handling of nanomaterials or cleaning of surfaces or vessels contaminated by nanomaterials are especially risky. In general, increasing the amount of energy used in any task leads to greater risk of exposure. Higher energy can result from, for example, dropping a material from greater height, using stronger agitation during cleaning, or increasing the pressure of an air jet. The quantity of a material being handled can impact exposures. As more of an engineered nanomaterial is produced, there is a greater opportunity for some of that material to be released, if all other factors are equal. Thus, there may be a greater chance of exposure in manufacturing environments than in research and development settings based solely on the quantity of material handled. However, other factors like the amount of manual handling can be different between these different scales of production that may make a manufacturing environment less risky. Finally, exposure is a product of the exposure concentration and the duration of exposure. Thus, the amount of time exposed is critical to evaluating the risk from an exposure event. If a task is performed infrequently, it may present a low risk for adverse health effects even if the exposure concentration is relatively high. Control measures such as laboratory hoods, enclosures, work practices, and personal protective equipment are also important determinants of exposure. I will not refer to them much in this module because they are covered in great detail in separate modules. Let's start our consideration of different processes by talking about synthesis processes. Demu and co-authors measured concentrations produced during the gas phase synthesis of metal-based nanoparticles coated with a porous metal oxide matrix. This figure shows number concentration measurements on the vertical axis collected across 17 days of production using a variety of direct reading instruments in different locations in a single workroom plotted against time through the synthesis process on the horizontal axis. The short horizontal lines represent the median concentration at each time period. The bars capture the 25th to 75th percentiles of the readings. The circles are considered outliers, and the whiskers represent the minimum and maximum concentrations after excluding the outliers. The data indicate that there are elevated particle levels relative to background concentrations during reactive cleaning prior to synthesis. During the synthesis process, particle number concentrations in the workroom air rise over the course of an hour until a fairly steady concentration is achieved during a two and a half hour synthesis period. As the synthesis process slows and stops, the particle levels in the workroom gradually decline. This study shows that open gas phase synthesis processes have the potential to generate elevated levels of nanoparticles. In this case, open means that the precursor feed is coming from outside the reactor rather than being contained inside. The authors counted, but did not characterize, the particles they sampled. So we are uncertain what percentage of the particles are the engineered nanoparticles being produced relative to incidental nanoparticles that could be part of the production process. The same research group also studied particles released into workplace air during synthesis of a variety of nanomaterials in four different laboratories using flame spray pyrolysis and open gas phase synthesis method. The reactors were placed in laboratory hoods or in separate ventilated enclosures. The researchers measured particle number concentrations, shown on the vertical axis, both in the near field close to the reactors, represented by the field markers in the figure, and in the far field away from the reactors, represented by open markers in the figure, for each of the nanomaterials shown on the horizontal axis. Even with the use of ventilated hoods and enclosures, the data indicate that the production of some oxidized nanomaterials created exposure concentrations above the background levels represented by the horizontal dashed line, while production of other nanomaterials did not. For example, number concentrations measured during tungsten trioxide synthesis were 10 to 20 times higher than concentrations observed during titanium dioxide synthesis in both the near field and far field. Production conditions also made a difference. For example, lengthening the collection filter to flame distance during bismuth phosphate nanoparticle synthesis increased the number concentrations. 
Sahu and Biswas compared particle number concentrations and size distributions generated during the production of titanium dioxide nanoparticles using a flame aerosol reactor, an open system, and then using a furnace aerosol reactor, a closed system. The figure shows particle size distribution by number with concentrations on the vertical axis and particle diameter on the horizontal axis. With this open system and relative to background concentrations shown in the lowest curve, the researchers were able to measure elevated levels of titanium dioxide particles, many of which were smaller than 100 nanometers in diameter, at three locations in the workroom represented by the three nearly overlapping curves. This next figure, plotting number concentration against time, shows that concentrations were on the order of 150,000 particles per cubic centimeter during production. It should be noted that the reactor was placed in a laboratory hood that was intentionally turned off during production. When the hood was turned on, concentrations were significantly reduced, illustrating the importance of control measures as a determinant of exposure. When the same authors measured particle number concentrations generated during synthesis with the closed system, they could not find levels above background, even though the furnace aerosol reactor was too large to be placed in a laboratory hood and had no additional ventilation. However, as shown in the figure that presents particle number concentration versus time, the authors noted that concentrations increased when the reactor was opened to recover product. Even during this operation, however, concentrations were an order of magnitude lower than during synthesis with the flame aerosol reactor. The comparison of these systems suggests that closed systems pose less risk for worker exposure during nanoparticle synthesis than open systems. Carbon nanotubes are most often synthesized using chemical vapor deposition, or CVD. Bellow and co-authors measured particle number concentrations during various steps of CVD synthesis of carbon nanotubes and plotted the data against time. Region 1 of the figure represents the background level of particles in the workroom. The subsequent steps include furnace heating, carbon nanotube growth, furnace cooldown, furnace opening to remove the lawn of carbon nanotubes, delamination of the carbon nanotubes from the substrate, and transfer of the carbon nanotubes to an epoxy coated substrate. None of these steps exhibited consistently elevated carbon nanotube concentrations. In particular, the lack of elevated concentrations during harvesting of carbon nanotubes is surprising because handling of other nanoparticles usually shows increased concentrations, as with the titanium dioxide particles on the previous slide. However, the authors note that the film of synthesized carbon nanotubes is held together strongly by van der Waals forces keeping individual carbon nanotubes from being released in measurable quantities. Nanoparticles synthesized in a liquid suspension are less likely to present significant exposures than nanomaterials synthesized in the gas phase because it is harder to aerosolize a liquid than a powder. Park and co-authors studied exposures in a manufacturing facility where silver nanoparticles are synthesized in a colloidal suspension. The top figure on this slide shows number concentrations on the vertical axis as a function of time on the horizontal axis. The bottom figure shows particle diameter as a function of time with different concentrations illustrated by color. During the synthesis period represented by background in the figures, the particle number concentrations in the workroom were the same as if the synthesis was not underway. However, when the hatch to the reactor was opened after synthesis was complete, particle concentrations increased. As shown in both figures, with the red line in the top figure and in the orange region on the lower figure, the greatest increase in concentration was a doubling in concentration for particles about 100 nanometers in size. Overall, the risks of exposure appeared to be relatively small for this synthesis process, except at the end when the reactor must be opened. Subsequent to the synthesis of the silver nanoparticles, however, the liquid suspension is dried and then processed into a powder by grinding. During the drying process, particle concentrations are essentially at background levels as shown in figure A. Once again though, as the dryer is opened, an increase in concentration for particles 60 to 120 nanometers in diameter is seen, although only for a brief two to three minute period. 
The grinding process, shown in Figure B, seems to present a greater risk of exposure. Elevated concentrations of nanoparticles are observed repeatedly throughout the grinding step. After grinding has been completed, a sharp increase in levels of particles 20 to 40 nanometers in diameter is observed. These data suggest that the production steps subsequent to synthesis may cause greater exposures than the synthesis process itself. In addition, the findings reinforce the notion that exposure risk increases for workers when a nanomaterial is in powdered form. It should be emphasized that each of these examples that illustrate potential worker exposures is a unique situation. Each workplace and process step is unique. There is evidence that nanomaterial synthesis on the production scale can be operated with no apparent increases in general particle levels. For example, Wong and co-authors compared particle surface area concentration and number concentration readings on the vertical axes in a silicon nanoparticle production facility over a four-hour period on the horizontal axis as nanoparticles were being synthesized to background surface area concentrations and number concentrations outside the work area. Aside from offset differences between specific direct reading instruments, the measurements were essentially the same inside the work area as outside. With proper process design, operating procedures, and engineering control measures, worker exposures can be minimized. Let's summarize some of the key points related to potential exposures during nanomaterial synthesis. Gas phase synthesis provides more opportunities for worker exposures than liquid phase synthesis because it is harder to generate particles, especially nanoscale particles, from a liquid suspension than from a nanopowder. Open systems where the precursors are fed from outside the reactor system, such as flame reactors, offer greater likelihood of worker exposures than closed systems, such as furnace reactors. Synthesis conditions and the specific nanomaterial being produced matter a lot and influence exposure concentrations. Processing steps after production, such as product recovery, drying, and grinding, can lead to greater exposures than the synthesis step itself. Overall, however, it is important to remember that exposures can be minimized with appropriate process design, operating procedures, and engineering control measures. Having a well-trained workforce can help to minimize exposures, too. Many synthesis processes are batch processes, meaning one batch is made, then the next batch, and then the next. In many, or perhaps most cases, the cleaning and maintenance of reactors between batches is primarily a manual process. As shown in this image, this can involve close contact of a worker with the inside of a reactor. Here, a worker is using a scraper and a brush to remove excess material from the reactor. These tasks may present significant exposure risks because workers are often interacting with nanopowders. The cleaning process supplies energy to the powders. The work is often done manually in close contact to the nanomaterials. And the tasks are performed repeatedly so that the cumulative duration of exposure is high. Cleaning processes are among the most likely steps to create worker exposures. Wong and co-authors found that cleaning was among the few special cases where they measured increased particle levels in a silicon nanoparticle production facility. As noted in the figure, both particle surface area concentrations and number concentrations, plotted on the vertical axes against time on the horizontal axis, showed spikes associated with cleaning processes over a period of about 10 minutes. A variety of techniques are used to clean reactors and other equipment used to produce nanomaterials. Zimmerman and co-authors measured particle number concentrations, plotted on a logarithmic scale on the vertical axis, generated by a variety of cleaning techniques, including air jets, dusters, scouring pads, scraping, liquid nitrogen, sanding, and heat guns, shown on the horizontal axis. The figure indicates that scraping and using a heat gun to loosen deposits created the highest number concentrations. Sanding, using liquid nitrogen, air jets, and a wet scouring pad generated somewhat lower concentrations. Overall, the data suggests that all of the cleaning techniques have some potential to create risky exposures. No one technique is clearly less risky than the others. This figure from Zimmerman and co-authors shows on the vertical axis the particle diameter at which the particle size distribution by number peaks 
for each cleaning process that release significant levels of particles. The diameter for the maximum ranges from 10 nanometers to 1000 nanometers or 1 micrometer. Many of the maximums are around 100 nanometers. This suggests that many of the nanoparticles are released as agglomerates, groupings of smaller primary nanoparticles that behave like a bigger particle. The authors present images like this one, which shows agglomerates of primary titanium nanoparticles with long dimensions of 60 and 120 nanometers. Another figure from the same paper shows concentrations during cleaning as a function of the synthesis method. Cleaning of systems that produce nanoparticles by molecular beam epitaxy, physical vapor deposition, plasma enhanced chemical vapor deposition, and vapor condensation exhibited the highest concentrations. Ordinary chemical vapor deposition, metal organic chemical vapor deposition, and matrix distributed electron cyclotron resonance devices exhibited no elevated concentrations. Here are a few key points regarding potential worker exposures during cleaning and maintenance of nanomaterial production equipment. First, cleaning and maintenance are generally manual processes in which workers are intensely involved. Second, workers are in close proximity to sources that can release nanoparticles into the air and the tasks sometimes are performed repeatedly. Both of these factors contribute to risks of chronic elevated exposures to nanoparticles. Third, the type of cleaning performed and the method used to synthesize a nanomaterial both influence observed concentrations. Fourth, workers are usually exposed to agglomerates of individual nanoparticles during these cleaning and maintenance tasks. I want to be sure to re-emphasize that cleaning and maintenance of synthesis equipment are key tasks for occupational hygienists to evaluate when considering potential exposures in nanotechnology, research, and production facilities. When powders are dropped or poured, the potential to generate airborne dust or particles depends on a variety of factors. The generation of particles from a powder depends on the relationship of the forces of cohesion that bind particles together versus the forces that work to separate particles. In general, as the ratio of the forces that separate particles increase relative to the forces of cohesion, more dust will form. One way to represent separation forces is using impaction, a variable describing the separation forces created by the impact of a falling powder on a pile of that powder. Plinka and co-authors studied this phenomenon experimentally using microscale particles. They used the apparatus represented in this diagram. A conveyor belt holding powder dropped the powder into a receiving hopper. A balance in the hopper helped to measure the impaction force. The drop height was varied to alter the impaction force. The amount of dust generated was measured using a sampler called the cascade impactor at the top of an elutriation column that allows the small particles to remain airborne while large ones settle to the bottom of the column. The researchers experimented with different types of powder and different moisture levels in the powders to evaluate the influence of forces that bind particles together. This figure shows the dust generation rate as a ratio, the mass of dust versus the mass of powder dropped on the vertical axis as a function of moisture content on the horizontal axis for four different microscale powders. The data show that the generation of particles decreased substantially as moisture content of the dust increased because higher levels of moisture tend to make the particles adhere together, thereby increasing cohesion forces. In short, drier powders are much more likely to generate airborne particles. This next slide from the same authors illustrates dust generation rate on the vertical axis again versus drop height on the horizontal axis for the same powders. Dust generation increases with drop height because impaction and the resulting separation forces increase as drop height becomes higher. These data are an example of how applying more energy to a potentially hazardous material can increase the amount of the material in the air. Although the data in this figure and the previous one were collected with powders that contained microscale particles, Similar processes will influence particle generation from nanoscale powders. 
The importance of the application of energy to a nanopowder was investigated experimentally by Maynard and co-authors, who agitated a single-walled carbon nanotube powder mixed with large brass beads in an open centrifuge tube using a vortex shaker. The researchers measured the sizes and concentrations of particles released to the air from the centrifuge tube. The figure shows particle number concentrations on the vertical axis as a function of particle diameter on the horizontal axis for five settings for agitation provided by the vortex shaker. The highest agitation setting of 91%, providing the most energy to the nanoparter, clearly caused the release of the greatest amount of nanomaterial, including many particles smaller than 100 nanometers. The second highest agitation setting, 64%, clearly caused the second highest release of nanomaterial. These data demonstrate the importance of the amount of energy applied to a nanomaterial as a determinant of releases of nanoparticles into the air. Handling and packaging of nanomaterials after synthesis poses a significant risk of worker exposures to airborne nanoparticles because these processes apply energy to the nanomaterial. For example, the worker in this image, from a paper by Evans and co-authors, is changing a bag containing carbon nanofiber product. The worker must tamp the product down into the bag and then close the bag before removing it from the container. As part of his job, he is regularly applying energy to a dry, open nanopowder through this manual handling, creating a significant risk of a repeated inhalation exposure. These authors measured concentrations of particles generated throughout the production cycle of carbon nanofibers in a single facility. This figure shows, on vertical axes, particle number concentrations in red, particle respirable mass concentrations in black, and particle surface area concentrations in green. The data are plotted as a function of time on the horizontal axis, and different steps in the production cycle are marked on the figure. The authors also measured carbon monoxide in blue, carbon dioxide in gray, and a photoelectric response in lavender that reflects particles from incomplete combustion. We will not consider these last three measurements further. Particle concentrations were only slightly elevated above background levels during carbon nanofiber synthesis, labeled as production on the figure. During the post-synthesis processing phase, however, Significant increases in particle concentrations were observed as particles were dried, thermally treated, and packaged. Particle number and surface area concentrations were elevated throughout the processing period. Event 1, shown in the photo, involved manual bagging of the final product. During this period, there was a significant increase in respirable mass concentration without much of an increase in number or surface area concentrations, likely reflecting an increase in concentrations of agglomerates of primary nanoparticles. During event two, an operator opened a dryer and manually redistributed carbon nanofiber product within the dryer. This step generated increases in number and surface area concentrations, indicating additional release of nanoparticles. Event three represents the dumping of dried particles. A short substantial increase in particle number respirable mass, and surface area concentrations are noted during this period. Event 4 was the operation of a radiant gas heater that caused an increase in number and surface area concentrations due to incidental nanoparticles produced by the heater. The data in this figure are extremely useful to illustrate how the handling and packaging of raw nanomaterials after synthesis can create significant exposures to airborne nanoparticles as well as to agglomerates of these individual nanoparticles. Any manual handling task with raw nanomaterials, especially nanopowders, is one that occupational hygienists should evaluate carefully for the risk of worker exposures. Other researchers have made similar observations to those of Evans and his co-authors. Fujitani and co-authors measured particle number concentrations inside a fullerene production facility during different product handling tasks. In the figure, Concentrations of four different sizes of particles on the vertical axis are tracked using different data markers as a function of time. The period from arrow C to arrow D represents indoor concentrations when no work was being performed. 
During the period from arrow D to arrow E, workers bagged fullerene product, causing a noticeable concentration increase for particles 10 to 50 nanometers in diameter. The period from arrow F to arrow G included the use of a vacuum cleaner to remove dust from the floor. This period showed a significant increase in particle number concentration for, again, particles 10 to 50 nanometers in diameter. Periods following arrows G and H were artificial attempts to agitate an open fullerene container using a jet of air. Arrow I represents measurements of outdoor air. The same authors also reported particle volume concentrations for the same tasks. Significant increases in volume concentrations, which are proportional to mass concentrations, were observed for particles 2,000 nanometers or 2 micrometers and larger during bagging and vacuuming, as well as during the artificial agitation periods. Fujitani and co-authors show that bagging and vacuuming tasks have the potential to generate significant exposures to individual nanomaterials, in this case those 10 to 50 nanometers in diameter, as well as to agglomerates of primary nanoparticles, represented by those greater than 2 micrometers in diameter. In a facility that produced nanostructured lithium titanate metal oxide powder, Tom Peters and co-authors measured particle number, respirable mass, and total mass concentrations during the manual tasks of loading a hopper of a rotary calciner with previously synthesized nanoparticles and changing the bag used to collect the product emerging from the calciner. The rotary calciner was used for high temperature thermal processing of the synthesized nanomaterial. As shown in the upper figure, showing particle number concentration as a function of time, the research team found that number concentration was not correlated well with the nanomaterial handling tasks. They were more likely a reflection of incidental nanoparticle generation by processes like welding or grinding. As shown in the lower figure that plots mass concentrations versus time, however, spikes in mass concentrations are associated with nanomaterial handling tasks. This suggests that these tasks did not release individual nanoparticles. In fact, the authors were able to image large particles like these that are aggregates of smaller individual particles. They were also able to take images of large chain agglomerate particles and large irregularly shaped amorphous particles, both of which were composed of smaller particles. The work of Peters and co-authors is further evidence that manual handling operations create significant exposure to airborne nanomaterials, although these exposures may not always include individual nanoparticles. Coolbush and co-authors report similar findings to the other studies we've looked at, although the processes they studied were more automated. In carbon black production, these authors measured particle size distributions by number generated during automated filling and changing of 1,000 kilogram bags. These operations have the potential to create exposures to nanomaterials for those working in this area. This figure shows the size distributions in the ambient air during bag changing and during bag filling, as well as ratios between these distributions. It should be noted that the vertical axis is number concentration on a logarithmic scale, so that differences that appear small may be very substantial. In this study, bag changing released particles in the 20 to 80 nanometer range, as well as particles larger than about 300 nanometers in diameter. Bag filling, on the other hand, only released particles larger than 300 nanometers. These larger particles are likely agglomerates of smaller primary nanoparticles. Not all measurements show elevated levels of airborne exposures in the handling and packaging of nanomaterials. Kaminsky and co-authors measured airborne particle number concentrations in several titanium dioxide and aluminum oxide bagging operations in large production facilities. The upper figure shows number concentrations for particles smaller than 100 nanometers in diameter on the vertical axis versus nine different locations in two production facilities. The first five sets of bars represent measurements in bagging operations. Concentrations in work areas, designated as WA, are not statistically different from background concentrations, designated by BG, for any of the five bagging operations. 
The lower figure represents particles larger than 100 nanometers in diameter. In only one bagging operation were particle concentrations significantly greater than background levels observed. However, in this aluminum oxide bagging area, concentrations were elevated by more than one order of magnitude. The authors indicate that this one operation suffered frequently from bag overfilling and damaged bags, leading to these elevated exposure concentrations, which were likely particle agglomerates. This study shows that elevated concentrations during handling and packaging are not inevitable. The evidence from this paper indicates that handling and packaging tasks can be performed in ways that minimize particle releases. Several key points can be taken away from our discussion of exposures that occur during handling and packaging tasks. First, the amount of energy imparted to a nanopowder will be an important determinant of how much dust is generated. In addition, nanopowders with high moisture content may be less prone to releasing particles into the air. Bagging processes are apt to release airborne particles in nanotechnology facilities, although this is not inevitable. Many of the particles generated during bagging may be loosely connected agglomerates of smaller primary particles or more tightly bound aggregates of smaller particles. Finally, all handling processes, but particularly those that are manual, should be evaluated for their potential to create unwanted exposures. The four primary environmental media through which people, labeled as receptors in this diagram, receive potentially harmful exposures are food, water, soil, and air. Exposures from food occur primarily through ingestion. Waterborne exposures occur via ingestion or through the skin. Similarly, exposures from soil come principally from the ingestion or dermal roots. Exposures through the air, however, have the possibility of occurring by inhalation, ingestion, as agents deposited in the respiratory tract are sometimes later swallowed, or through the skin. In laboratory settings, those working to try to analyze nanomaterials may be primarily concerned about inhalation exposures through the air, as in this illustration from Johnson and co-authors, where carbon-based nanomaterials are labeled as CNM. However, the nanoparticles released into the air may settle on work surfaces where they present a risk of dermal exposure. In addition, these particles may deposit directly onto skin or clothes, presenting additional dermal exposure risks. These pathways are of importance to workers with responsibilities to analyze and characterize nanomaterials in laboratories. Just as in the handling of production batches of nanomaterials, the handling of nanomaterials in laboratories can create potential exposures for workers. As illustrated in these images at the top, Tsai and her co-authors compared the concentrations and sizes of particles released during the transfer of a nanoalumina powder, gradually using a spatula, to the concentrations and sizes when the nanopowder was poured from one container to another. They also studied the influence of the height of the sash on a laboratory hood and the subsequent change in velocity of the air entering the hood on particle generation. The graphs show particle number concentration as a function of particle diameter for three different air velocities as the nanopowder is transferred gradually on the left and when the nanopowder is poured on the right. For the two lowest air velocities of 0.4 meters per second in blue and 0.6 meters per second in red, Pouring produces slightly more particles smaller than 100 nanometers and slightly fewer particles larger than 100 nanometers. However, for the highest air velocity of 1 meter per second in green, pouring leads to much higher concentration of particles larger than 100 nanometers than for any of the other test conditions. These measurements suggest that more significant exposures can occur when more energy is imparted to the nanomaterial even to small quantities in a lab setting. Furthermore, just as in the manufacturing setting, particles may be released as agglomerates of smaller primary particles, in addition to potential releases as individual particles. Johnson and co-authors investigated additional lab handling processes to see if they may release airborne nanoparticles. These authors looked at weighing of fullerene and multi-walled carbon nanotube nanopowder samples, 
and they're transferred to a mixing beaker. In addition, they measure particle generation during sonication of aqueous suspensions made out of both the fullerenes and the carbon nanotubes. The table shows particle number concentrations for the four processes, two for each nanomaterial. Concentrations were measured in different size intervals by two different instruments. Concentrations measured during the work tasks are reported in the third column. Average background concentrations are in the fourth column. And the difference between the two columns, assumed to be the concentrations of nanoparticles that are generated, are in the fifth column. All of the processes produced airborne nanomaterials. This is particularly significant for the sonication step because this shows that there is a risk of exposure even when the nanomaterial is in a liquid suspension. Because so many particles are found in size intervals larger than 100 nanometers, the data suggests that much of the material may have been generated as particle agglomerates containing many primary particles rather than as individual particles. Transmission electron microscope images of particles sampled as each of the tasks was conducted support this assertion. The fullerenes in images B and C are loose agglomerates of primary particles. The objects in images D, E, and F are more tangled agglomerates of individual nanotubes. In addition to these handling tasks that may be required in laboratories, there are a wide range of analytical procedures used to characterize nanomaterials. These include, but are not limited to, powder X-ray diffraction, transmission electron microscopy, scanning electron microscopy, electron energy loss spectroscopy, atomic force microscopy, scanning tunneling microscopy, small angle X-ray scattering, atomic pair distribution function, energy dispersive X-ray analysis, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, electron absorption spectroscopy, photoluminescence, Raman spectroscopy, magnetic characterization, infrared spectroscopy, and isothermal titration calorimetry. The analytical options are many. Exposure risks during these procedures have not been characterized. These risks may or may not be minor, but precautions should certainly be taken until the risks are better understood. Key points to consider for those working to characterize nanomaterials in laboratory settings include, one, that handling even small amounts of engineered nanomaterials may lead to significant exposures, two, that exposures are possible for nanomaterials in powders or liquid suspensions, three, that many different lab and analytical procedures are utilized to characterize nanomaterials with each having its own potential exposure risks, and four, that the probability of lab worker exposures during most of these procedures is poorly understood at this point. After engineered nanomaterials have been produced, they are incorporated into engineered nanomaterial enabled products. Among these many, many products are sunscreens and cosmetics with nano titanium dioxide or nano zinc oxide, anti fouling coatings for ship hulls that contain carbon nanotubes, Bandages that use nanosilver to prevent infection. Socks with nanosilver to reduce odors caused by bacteria. Memory technology that utilizes carbon nanotubes. Sporting goods that use carbon nanotubes to make them lighter and stronger. Self-cleaning coatings for building exteriors that use the photocatalytic properties of nanotitanium dioxide and hairstyling equipment that uses nanotitanium dioxide to produce ions purported to be beneficial to the hair. While unique exposures can be anticipated in workplaces that produce ENM enabled products, relatively few studies have been performed to evaluate worker exposures in these facilities. Molman and co-authors measured concentrations of particles generated during a variety of production processes including mixing zinc oxide nanopowder into a liquid, quenching a nano zinc oxide paste between rollers, filling and emptying an oven with indium tin oxide, 
spraying a suspension of silicon dioxide nanoparticles, and flame spraying of silanes to form a coating on a surface. These concentrations were compared to concentrations in outdoor air. As shown in columns two and three of the table, the median particle diameters for each operation and the particle diameters with the maximum concentration for each operation were all smaller than 100 nanometers. As shown in columns four and five, only two operations exhibited particle number concentrations substantially above outdoor concentrations, flame spraying of silanes and spraying of the silicon dioxide suspension. The data in these columns indicate that both nanoparticles and larger particles were present. These significant increases in particle levels may present a risk of exposure for workers in these operations. However, the data need to be considered with caution because the authors did not perform analyses to ensure that the generated particles contained engineered nanomaterials rather than being byproducts of the spraying or flame spraying processes. Tsai and co-authors studied nanoparticle releases during the compounding of nanocomposite plastics with nanoalumina particles. As shown in the photo, aluminum oxide nanoparticles were fed through a port to combine with a polymethyl methacrylate resin feed into a high temperature extruder that compounded the nanoalumina into the polymer. Measurements were taken over a nearly three hour period. The black curve on this figure shows particle number concentration on the left vertical axis plotted against time on the horizontal axis. The gray curve shows medium particle diameter on the right vertical axis plotted against time. Period one is the equipment warm up time. Period two is the setup time when the nanoalumina feed port was calibrated. And period three is the period when only polymer was being fed into the extruder. During period four, aluminum oxide was fed at a rate so that it would make up 2% of the nanocomposite plastic. During period five, the aluminum oxide was fed at a rate to make up 5% of the nanocomposite. During phase one, incidental nanoparticle fumes were released from the extruder as it heated up. In phase two, a noticeable increase in number concentration occurred likely due to the release of agglomerated aluminum oxide nanoparticles as the feed port was calibrated. During period three, when only polymethyl methacrylate resin was fed to the extruder, particle concentrations decreased. Then, during periods four and five, particle concentrations increased again when nanoalumina particles were introduced into the extruder. Images like this one of samples taken during the compounding process show a distinct presence of individual nanoalumina particles, as well as relatively large agglomerates of primary aluminum oxide nanoparticles. This study shows that the compounding of nanoparticles into a nanocomposite plastic presents a risk of exposure to operators working nearby. Mazzucchelli, Methner, and co-authors reported measurements made of worker exposures to carbon nanofibers during polymer nanocomposite production. They measured both particle number concentrations and the mass concentrations for particles 10 micrometers in diameter and smaller. In addition to indoor and outdoor background concentrations, the research team measured concentrations as the extruded nanocomposite was chopped during transferring and mixing activities in a work area referred to as the cage. As the carbon nanofiber composite was cut with a water-cooled, dust-suppressed table saw, and during manual sifting of oven-dried epoxy-coated carbon nanofibers to remove large clumps. Particle number concentrations, read on the left vertical axis from the filled symbols, were slightly elevated during transferring and mixing activities in the cage and during the cutting with the wet saw. Mass concentrations on the right vertical axis using open symbols were somewhat elevated during the transferring and mixing operations. During the wet saw cutting, mass concentrations jumped significantly. A transmission electron microscope image of a particle sample during the mixing operation shows that the larger particles were likely bundles of individual nanofibers. Taken together, these data indicate that manual handling processes and processes that supply energy to the nanomaterial 
are those that are likely to lead to increased worker exposures to nanomaterials. To summarize key points related to the manufacture of engineered nanomaterial enabled products, the evidence that exists shows that worker exposures to engineered nanomaterials are certainly possible as they are incorporated into enabled products. As with some of the other processes we considered in earlier sections, many exposures may be to agglomerates of primary nanoparticles. Exposure evaluation is a challenge because production processes may produce incidental nanoparticles at the same time as engineered nanomaterials are released. Many measurement techniques cannot differentiate engineered nanoparticles from natural and incidental nanoparticles. Finally, occupational hygienists must keep in mind that every process is unique. While we can learn from the literature and from experience with similar processes, we must be careful to keep an open mind and evaluate each operation individually. Before wrapping up, I want to revisit and reemphasize the determinants of potential exposure discussed toward the beginning of the module. Dustiness is a critical parameter. In particular, dry nanopowders are more likely to release nanoparticles to the air than liquid suspensions containing nanoparticles. The type of process strongly influences the potential for exposures. Processes that require workers to handle nanomaterials manually and those that involve the application of forces and energy to a nanomaterial are more likely to create risky exposures than those that do not. The amount of material being used is another important determinant of exposure. If all other factors are equal, as more of an engineered nanomaterial is produced, there is a greater opportunity for some of that material to be released. We must also remember that exposure is a product of the exposure concentration and the duration of exposure. Thus, the duration of a task or a process step may be a critical determinant of worker exposure. Let's summarize a few main points for the module. During the synthesis of nanomaterials, open systems in which precursors are fed from outside the reactor offer greater likelihood of exposure than closed systems. As mentioned on the previous slide, nanopowders offer greater risk of exposure than nanomaterials in liquid suspensions. With increasing energy imparted to a nanomaterial, there is a greater risk of release of particles that will present a risky exposure to workers. Finally, the cleaning and maintenance of reactors and the handling and packaging of nanomaterials are processes with particularly high exposure potential. Occupational hygienists must keep in mind that these airborne releases present the potential for exposures by both the inhalation and dermal routes. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training, or METFAST, program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of the National Institutes of Health. Thanks for joining me.